would be other topics which would include normal anatomy of the cervix, squamoclumnar junction, transformation zone, benign lesions of the cervix, pap smear or cytology, and CIN or pre-invasive lesions of the cervix, HPV infection. Now all these seven subjects, if I talk to you straight away, carcinoma cervix will not be covered in that because usually it's carcinoma, what type, the pathology, symptoms, signs, that way. In, but these are essentials for you to know about before we jump on to carcinoma cervix. So my concentration today will be first on covering these basics, but because every one of them can be covered in half an hour, 45 minutes lecture. And today I'll try to cover them all in half an hour, all in half an hour. So you can imagine that it will be very superficial information which I'll give you, but hope that with that superficial information, we'll be able to talk about carcinoma cervix as well. The first topic which I've written is normal anatomy of the cervix. All of you are familiar with this photograph or sketch in which you can see the whole uterus, fallopian tubes and ovaries. But today we are focusing on to cervix. So you can see body of the uterus and cervix, they have certain ratio. Two thirds of the length is belongs to the body. One third belongs to the cervix. And second thing is, that cavity of the uterus communicates with the vagina through cervical canal, which is very narrow canal. And vagina uh, communicates with the outside world. And so we are lucky in that way with this anatomy, we can inspect tip of the uterus or cervix through a speculum examination, which is a great help in physical examination. And Second thing is, the uterine cavity is lined by endometrium, which is low cuboidal epithelium. And same epithelium covers the internal os or uh, the uh, internal canal, the cervical canal from internal os to external os. So it is a continuation of columnar or cuboidal epithelium from the uterine cavity in the cervical canal, but but somebody wants to talk to me. No, sir. Yeah. But the outer surface of the cervix is covered by the same epithelium which covers the vagina. That is stratified squamous epithelium. So outer side of the cervix is covered by stratified squamous epithelium, and cervical canal is covered by the cuboidal, low cuboidal or columnar epithelium and they meet at a certain point, which is at the tip of the cervix, where it is known as external os. And the junction of the two, columnar epithelium and stratified squamous epithelium is known as squamocolumnar junction. So in this, as you look at it, the script, cervix is the lower end of the uterus. In the adult, cervix is one third, and the outer cervix is covered by stratified squamous epithelium and columnar epithelium lines the cervical canal and junction of the two is called squamocolumnar junction. This junction is very important because this is the point where carcinoma cervix starts or originates. So that's why we'll be talking about more squamocolumnar junction. Squamocolumnar junction, if you see, is uh, located at the junction of the endocervical canal and in the external os. And the external os uh, is located at the act ectocervix, which is part of the covered, as I said earlier, by stratified squamous epithelium. And the it, this epithelium responds to the stimulation of estrogens and progesterone, like the endometrium as well. 
there's another information the trans transformation zone for today's lecture about carcinoma service this zone is very important because this is the zone zone which lies at the junction of columnar epithelium and certified squamous epithelium and this shifts with puberty and menopause before puberty i mean this junction lies high up in the canal and during adulthood between menarche and menopause it lies at external loss and after menopause it again recedes into the cervical canal this information is important because transformation zone located as comoclonal junction is the site where generally carcinoma cervix starts so to look for the site where the malignancy starts you have to have information about transformation zone and as i said it, the position of the zone keeps changing with age or with puberty and menarche now before we go on to carcinoma cervix there are few benign lesions of the cervix which at least we should be familiar with and these benign lesions are you know, adenomyoma myoma papilloma and after that we will be talking about malignant diseases that is carcinoma sarcoma and mesodermal mixed tumor and first of all the first the commonest benign lesion of the cervix which is known as cervical erosion or ectopy this is the word ectopy is used and this uh, ectopy is when squamoclonal junction shifts from its normal position to the outside at the ecto cervix the result is stratified squamous epithelium looks pink when you look at it macroscopically whereas columnar epithelium looks red so because of the shifting of squamoclonal junction on to ecto cervix so part of ecto cervix looks red and this is the shifting of squamoclonal junction on to the surface of the ecto cervix and that is now cause ectopy this is a benign lesion it's not malignant this shifting of squamoclonal junction in most of the patients is without any reason it can happen but sometimes it happens because of hyperstimulation with estrogens or hormonal influence and very rarely infection when ectopy is present the patient may not have any symptoms at all and it may be only incidental physical finding on speculum examination whereas in some cases patient might complain of vaginal discharge which is excessive normal physiological discharge which means it is colorless odorless discharge very rarely it may be blood stain but if the ectopy is present and it is not causing any symptoms you need not treat it whereas if it does cause symptoms like discharge discomfort or anything uh, blood straining then you might have to deal with it or treat it generally we cauterize with electric cautery and the patient gets healed uh, ectopy after 6 weeks or so next lesion which you may see benign lesion is a polyp generally this polyp is adenomatous polyp and it may be single as you see in the left side or it there may be multiple as you can see on the right side the polyp is usually adenomatous start initiates from columnar epithelium but sometimes endometrial polyp may come down and may look like it then in such a situation the polyp which is covered by columnar epithelium it looks red and it is usually asymptomatic but when it becomes symptomatic same similar symptoms as ectopy then you might have to remove it 
it can be easily averse even without anesthesia. But rarely you may have to do it under anesthesia and you don't forget to have histopathology done. But this is a benign lesion. Before we go on, there's one topic which needs nearly one hour to speak about it, that is cytology or pap smear uh, of the cervix. The, the cytology is really microscopic study of the cells and it's different from histology because histology is micro study of tissues, which means group of cells. In cytology, you see individual cells. It's a, a great advancement in the management of gynecological patients because just collection of cells from the cervix or vagina can give you a lot of information. As I said, this subject as a whole needs a long lecture to give it, but to, for today's talk, just remember cytology is a useful tool for investigation of our patients, particularly those with malignancy, and it is study of the cells. This cervical cytology was initiated by Pepper Nicolau in 1920, Italian gynecologist. And a pap smear is the name given in respect of Pepper Nicolau to date. That is the study of cells taken from cervix and under microscope. Uh, that is why it is called pap smear. Or uh, technically speaking, it is cervical exfoliative cytology. There, with this, we study the shed cells from the surface of the ectocervix and endocervix. And the, obviously, these cells are under the influence of hormones. So their cytological appearance changes. And for this, we have to collect specimen from the cervix, which I'll show you in a minute how to do it. And then fix the, those cells. And it's then after fixation, stain them and then examine them examine them under microscope and generally in healthy patients this study is carried out every three years that to make sure there is no malignancy this picture shows you how we collect the smear from the cervix and with that with the uh, uh, spatula which is used is known as Ars spatula and on, from the surface of after rubbing the spatula on the cervix we put the secretions on a slide and fix them and stain them and study them well as I said earlier cytology itself needs full lecture but just introduction that cytology is used to study cells shed from the cervix and the, the cells, if they have features of normal uh, cells, it means there's no malignancy. If they have features of malignancy, which every cell where, where, which undergoes malignancy shows hyperchromatic nucleus, large nucleus, and as compared to the cytoplasm, the ratio is changed the nucleus is bigger than cytoplasm. In a normal cell, cytoplasm is bigger than uh, the nucleus. And maybe in some cases, you might find mitotic figures and all that. So this is cytology. Now in this uh, picture, what you see is normal epithelium. And next to that, you see at the basement level, lower down the malignant change in the cells but superficial cells are normal and then in next the malignant cells are occupying even up to the middle area of stratified squamous epithelium and in third all the cells right up to the superficial surface area they are malignant so according to the level at which you see malignant cells 
you call them CAN1, CAN2, CAN3. CAN is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. But in all three of them, basement membrane is intact. So this is only in the epithelial layer that malignant cells are present. That's why it's called in situ or intraepithelial. And that's why the name CAN. But on the extreme right side of the picture, you see malignant cells going below or deeper to basement membrane. And this is the stage where we call the malignancy has become invasive. That means it has gone deeper to the basement membrane. And that invasive stage means uh, uh, carcinoma or malignancy, which is beyond the epithelial layer in invading the deeper tissues. So CIN is important to learn because most of the malignancies, they start as from normal to CIN1 stage. Then if it continues to grow, it becomes CIN2 and that eventually becomes CIN3. And if it invades the basement, basement membrane, then we, we call it invasive or uh, This slide tells you that why CIN is important. Because CIN1 gradually becomes CIN2, and CIN2 becomes gradually CIN3 if left untreated. And if even CIN3 is left untreated, then it becomes um, invasive carcinoma. But the duration or period which it will take from CAN1 to invasive carcinoma is variable. In some cases, it may be soon, within short period of four years. But in other cases, it may take long time, quarter of a century, to become invasive carcinoma. This is a totally different topic as compared to CIN, it is HPV, herpes, papilloma virus, uh, virus infection. And we have seen in recent years, papilloma virus is basically seen in more than 98, 99% carcinoma the cervix patients. It means there's direct relationship of HPV infection with invasive carcinoma cervix. So if we screen our patients for H presence of HPV infection, then we can catch up before carcinoma cervix appears or invasive carcinoma is there. That means I may be at CIN stage or even earlier. So if we do this kind of screening, we can save our patients from invasive carcinoma. And this flow chart shows you uh, how useful HPV infection screening is. If we screen them and there's no infection, it is negative, you need not worry that the malignancy won't be there. But if response is positive, then we have to do cytology, which just now I mentioned, and that will guide us whether the patient needs further investigations or needs only reassurance. And if the papilloma virus belongs to type 16 and 18, they are two types of papilloma virus which are responsible for the invasive carcinoma, such patients need not only cytology, even colposcopy to make an early diagnosis. With this background, now we come to our topic of the day, carcinoma of cervix. The carcinoma of cervix should be discussed under these nine headings. First, introduction, what carcinoma cervix is, then the risk factors, 
particularly HPV related to this, which I've just mentioned. And then the clinical staging of carcinoma, pathology of carcinoma, microinvasive cancer, then it's clinical course and management, and finally five years survival date. We hurriedly go through this list of topics. Carcinoma cervix is one of the leading causes of cancer deaths in women. As a matter of fact, internationally, they, they, although there's decline, but most of the women who die of carcinoma, carcinoma cervix is on top of the list after CA breast. And internationally, that there's decline of CA cervix because, as I mentioned earlier, we can screen our patients now or HPV infection, and then by cytology, and then if need be, well, we can give prophylaxis to our young girls to avoid HPV infection. And this decline is because of preventive measures and availability of cheap screening methods of pap smear. And there also, there's increased awareness in the public or in the our patient population and because they are aware so they are volunteer for pap smear so and that means early diagnosis of our patients see cervix as i said is the commonest cancer in women and breast is more common ca breast uh, CA cervix is next to it. And as I said, 75% of gynec malignant patients are belong to CA cervix because we, we do screening of our best patients and ovarian, and they can be diagnosed early and treated early. And public awareness is there. So if you are going to be a gynecologist, you should increase the awareness by public awareness campaign and it will bring the malignancy in your population down. There are certain types of population who are more likely to suffer from CA cervix. Those patients who get early married and first quietus is at early age and they are more prone to have carcinoma cervix. Similarly, those who have multiple sexual partners and uh, those who have multiple parity, and they are those who produce a large number of children. And those patients who have male partner with multiple sexual partners, so he can transfer HPV infection from other women to this patient, this woman, and uh, that, that HPV infection, as I said earlier, is the cause of CA cervix. And naturally, presence of HPV infection means it's a warning sign. So you should watch them closely, monitor them closely, and treat them as early as possible. Where after pap smear, maybe colposcopy, and necessary treatment. And those who have particularly HPV of 16 and 18 types. The HPV is of multiple types, but out of those, those who are 16 and 18 type, they are more responsible for CA cervix. So they need closer supervision. And similarly, other viral infections, they are also responsible for CA cervix. They should like herpes simplex and things like that. And it is generally, in large studies, it has been seen, those who take OCs, oral contraceptive pills, they are also at a higher risk. And the chlamydia infection patients also, their risk factor is higher. Those who smoke, they also have high risk factors. And unfortunately, Low social status patients, maybe because of early marriage, multiple children, 
frequent quitus and frequent more partners. That is the cause. But low social data also has higher risk of CSR risk. In addition to these etiological factors or social factors which I mentioned, the causative factor, as I said earlier, HPV infection, more than 98%, 99% patients, they have, uh, patients of CSRX have HPV infection and generally 16 and 18 types. And the other types also are responsible, but they are nearly uh, as compared to 16 and 18, less common. And herpes simplex and spermatozoar quitus itself is responsible for initiating carcinoma cervix. It seems that sometimes the spermatozoar and cult are taken in by uh, uh, the epithelial cells and so they add to the protoplasm and nucleus and which eventually becomes cancerous. I have already given you some detail about HPV infection and the, this, this is how this slide gives you the information how HPV infection gets into the cell and then changes the proteins or changes its division and becomes cancer. Talking about cancer clinically, it can be microinvasive or macroinvasive. I mentioned earlier in my talk that CAN1 can become 2, CAN3, and up to ligand cells invade the basement membrane, and the cells get into the deeper areas, deeper tissues that is invasive. So if we catch a patient or treat a patient who has just in invasion of the basement membrane and the ligand cells are not gone into the deeper tissues and are spread out, then microinvasion can be treated with conservative management or conservative met methods. This is invasive carcinoma. The photograph shows you it has started at the external loss of squamocular junction and at early stage it is limited to the cervix only and this is called this stage one generally the carcinoma is either ulcerative type or polypoidal type this picture shows you ulcerative type the typical malignant ulcer can be seen with uh, the uh, uh, a base in which it bleeds very easily to touch and margins are irregular and raised and surrounding tissues, it emitters and all these are features of malignancy. Most of the patients have squamous cell carcinoma, 80%. But a small number have adenocarcinoma which starts in the columnar epithelium of cervical canal and 5% they have mixed pathology and really it is undifferentiated. Talking about various stages of clinical stages of the carcinoma. You know management of carcinoma depends at what stage you see the patient. If you see the patient at an early stage, stage one, the prognosis is good for her. And the prognosis gets worse as the stage advances from stage one to two, three, and four. Four is the last stage. And these stages are further divided into stage one is one A and one B. And similarly, two A and two B, third stage is A and B again, and so is a and B, depending upon the size and invasion of the cancer, the stage is. This uh, sketch shows you the various stages. I hope you can read it because it's a rather 
uh, small print and a, a compound picture. But on top of it, you can see stage one. And in this stage one means carcinoma is limited to the cervix. And 1A means micro-invasion. And 1B means macro-invasion or macroscopically invasion, where perhaps to the naked eye it is not visible. And two, uh, one B is macroscopic. It's again further divided into one B, one and two, uh, depending upon the size of invasion. Similarly, two stage means the in cervix uh, cancer has gone beyond cervix, uh, either uh, into the parametrium are into the upper part of the vagina. So accordingly, it is called 2A and 2B. Similarly, stage 3 is carcinoma has invaded the parametrium to the level that it reaches the bone. There is no free space between the cancer and the bone. It is involving all of parametrium on any side. Or it involves the lower part of vagina. So this is 3A and 3B, and stage 4 is when cancer is involving the pelvic organs, bladder or rectum, or even has got distant metastasis, which means a metastasis into the lungs or anywhere else. This is again pictorial presentation of various stages. That is stage 1 stage two, three, and four, which I've already given you that. Then we come to after staging, clinical features or symptoms and signs. Arsinoma cervix may be early stages, has no, sim no symptoms and no signs, because if it is microscopic or very early lesion, it may not cause any symptoms, but generally, it may cause irregular bleeding, particularly postmenopausal bleeding, postcoital bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, or sometimes heavy bleeding. Other than that bleeding, it may cause discharge or postcoital discomfort. And the uh, other symptoms would be pain, lower abdomen, or difficult if it involves bladder difficulty or frequency of micturition, if it involves rectum, then difficulty of defecation. When you look at the signs, as I said earlier, pathology, that the malignancy could be ulcerative, forming an ulcer, or polypoidal. Polypoidal means like a polyp. It may be projecting from the cervical canal, uh, hanging into the vagina. But this polyp is different to benign polyp, uh, the surface will be uh, easily uh, necrotic and bleeding and it may be covered with a lot of blood and pus and uh, secondly, the uh, bleeding may be excessive or it may not stop. When these symptoms are present, then before we go on to the treatment, I would like to say a few words about prevention. These days, the prevention means routine pap smear of all women. And the pap smear should start even early after early marriage and go on till the age of 65. And if the pap smear is reported negative, it should be repeated every three years. If we do pap smear regularly and screen our all the patients regularly, we'll catch our patients at the either at CAN stage or micro-invasion stage, which um, at the latest may be stage one, which carries good prognosis for the patient after proper treatment. The 
Second is histological diagnosis. If you have suspicion, then you can do colposcopy or colposcopic directed biopsy of the cervix, which can help you to make a histopathological diagnosis. Third is use of vaccine or HPV screening is also a great help in prevention of the malignancy. If a patient does have carcinoma cervix, CA cervix at stage one, you can treat it either by radical hysterectomy, which is called Vardhan hysterectomy, or by radiotherapy. Both have similar results, about 80%, five, five years survival rate. And uh, so you should do surgery only if you have expertise of doing radical surgery, or in other words, it should be done in uh, gynecological uro, uh, uro, uh, gynecology malignancy department. Whereas if you're not doing it routinely, then radiotherapy, if available, produces similar results. But other than stage one, stage two to three, it should be treated by radiotherapy and chemotherapy. As I said earlier, lucky we are lucky. HPV vaccine is available in the market and uh, it should be given be even before marriage or first quarters. And if we give vaccine, then it provides prophylaxis uh, against CA cervix, which is a great thing for our next generation of girls and patients. The vaccine is given in three doses at six monthly interval. It is a little expensive, but as I said, preferably the vaccine should be given even before first quarter takes place. If we treat stage one, then even up to 95% survival is seen, but definitely more than 80%. But uh, in stage two, we carry 75% survival rate, and stage three, 50% survival rate. So the sooner we deal with it, better prognosis for our patients. Well, uh, I've kind of rushed through the topic, but uh, I'm sure when you get back home, you will like to go through the chapter and find out whatever I've said, build up your knowledge on that. And secondly, I've given you six SAQs after this lecture, try to answer those, and uh, because your examination a, a, a university examination is through SCQs or MCQs. So uh, at the end of the talk, I'd like to give you these six SCQs and some MCQs, six, eight, eight of them. And last slide, don't look at it first, look at it at last because it gives you answers to all the MCQs. Thank you very much. I am so happy you've given me this opportunity to talk to you. I hope there will be more occasions or opportunities of talking to each other. I, I wish this was in, interactive so that you could ask me some questions and maybe I could answer you those. But I'm looking forward to continue this activity. I hope the other subjects, physicians, surgeons, IE and T, PhDs, they are also doing this activity while the college is closed because this is the best way we can make use of our crisis time when the college is closed, but active education activity can continue like this, which I'm uh, I'm so excited about it that uh, it should be made good use and even after the crisis is over, we should continue to do this way of 
educating undergraduates i please give your feedback about this so that we can improve modify correct ourselves for the future because interactive means your feedback and accordingly corrective measures will be taken right last of all i thank our principal professor tarun so for giving me this opportunity to talk to you thank you good luck i hope pakistan comes out of this crisis soon and we get back to normal activity thanks